cover a lot of ground. We're going to try to do this whole chapter this morning. So, um, I'm going to begin by just reading verse 7, and then we'll study the whole chapter. So Romans 15, 7. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Father, thank you that you received us. And Lord, we want to be like you. And that's why we study your word. That's why we're here. Uh, that you would transform us. That you would make us like your son. And so Lord, speak to our hearts. Renew our minds. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So we're still continuing in the practical section of Romans. Uh, and this particular section, and most of the practical section, is how Christians are to treat each other. Because <clears throat> uh, despite the practice of many, the Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. It's not meant to be done independent. It, we are put not only as a child of God, but into the family of God. And so the Christian life is meant to be done with other Christians. And so uh, how we treat each other. Verse 1 says, <clears throat> We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And we touched on these first three verses in our last study uh, at the end of chapter 14. But just to, uh, we'll go over it again real qu quick here. Uh, when it mentions those who are strong, and that's a reference uh, to what he'd been talking about in chapter 14. Those who have faith in the fact that we have freedom as Christians. We have freedom in Christ in these and he's talking about people who tend less toward legalism, more toward freedom. And he says to those people, the ones that are strong, that they ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. And, and scruples there means weaknesses. And so we're to understand that there are those who are, uh, where aren't, that are not at the same place as the rest. Not everybody's at the same place in their Christian life. And that when we see those that are uh, weaker, uh, as Christians, we're not to beat them up over those differences and those different uh, ways of thinking. And then also the strong are, he also says, are not to please ourselves. When, when we encounter a person who is different in their walk or is weaker in their faith, perhaps they have more restrictions on their life, like he mentioned in chapter 14, as a Christian. There's two ways we can go about that. We can, on the one hand, we can demand that they line up with us and try to force them to think and act exactly the same way that we do and think like us. Or we can just reach out to them right where they are. Or we can try to do what pleases us, you know, get them to conform, or we can bear with them in their weaknesses. <coughs> and the Apostle Paul says, reach down. Reach out right where they are. Put their needs first. Don't try to make them feel like they have to be just like you. And, and we mentioned how parents or adults do this with kids all the time. You know, kids are a perfect example. A little child's a perfect example of somebody who's weaker than, the, than an adult. And the adult doesn't demand that the child do and act and uh, do everything. Like, for example, she, this little girl right here, she just peeked her head in the door. That's cute. She's a little girl. But if one of you did that, I'd probably give you a dirty look because I'd be like, what are you doing? But it, if she does it, I just think it's cute. So I might get distracted, but it's still cute. And so we bear with those things of weakness for those who are at that place. And, and that's what he tells us to do. Be like that toward those who are weaker than you. Do, do what is pleasing or what's best for them and what will make them stronger. Not what will make them struggle more, not what will make them feel bad or feel weak or feel defeated. And again, this is all in light of those doubtful things that we studied the last two uh, studies in chapter 14. Um, these, we're not talking about, you know, meet them where they are if somebody's living in sin. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about saying, oh, it's okay, just, we'll just meet you where you are and it's okay if you... Now, we'll welcome anyone even in their sin. But we'll let you know, hey, you, you got to do something different there. You can't, you can't be doing that. But, but we don't try to be pleasing 
when someone's in sin or in rebellion, uh, but when it's a debatable issue, when it's one of those issues we talked about the last couple times. It's something that will build them up, meet, meet them there. And he tells us why. Verse 3 says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach approached you fell on me for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and hope and or patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope so he he gives us there he reminds us that when he tells us about these things and how we're to meet people where they are and you know uh bear with their scruples that we have a perfect example in this jesus himself that's what jesus did Jesus did this. In fact, he never didn't do this. I mean, think about it. This is God in human flesh. Every time he interacted with anyone, anyone, imagine that. Any time he interacted with anyone, they were below his level. Like, and not just a little bit, like a whole bunch below his level. So, and any time he deals with us to this day, if you've been a Christian for 50 years, he's still condescending to your level to, to interact with you. And so he, we have this example. He didn't, he didn't live to get his way. He is the ultimate example of putting others first. And it's worth reading Philippians 2 here. I'm going to read Philippians 2, verse 3 to 8. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus lived for us. He didn't live for himself. He lived for others. And, and so we have him as a, an example. And not only that, but he quotes Psalm 69 there to show that he did that in fulfillment of what God said. He, it, says, it says, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus, not, o- not only did he lived for others so much so that he took upon all, the, all that we deserved, he took upon himself. But not only that, but Paul says those things were written about him. They were written not only because he, so that we would know about him, and we definitely, they were written for that purpose, but also for our learning. Everything that it says about Jesus in the Bible, whether it was in the Old Testament before he came or in the New Testament after he came, it was written uh, definitely so that we could have some interesting and amazing stories to read, for sure, but they're also extremely instructive to us. How do they instruct us? Look, it says, for our patience and for our hope. God understands that we're just dust. He gets that. He knows that. He understands we're weak. He knows that him calling us as sinners to live for him is, is not uh, going to be an easy thing for us in this life. And so he's given us a, a bunch of ways to help us to be able to do it. And two of those ways is he's, he gave us his son to show us what he means. This is how to live. But he also gives us his word. He gives us the scriptures to show us patience and comfort. He show, in the Bible, we learn how patient God is with us. In the Bible, we learn how much he wants to comfort us. Think about what comfort is given in the Word of God to sinners. Think about when you read how God acts toward a sinner. And not just a sinner, but someone who's rebellious toward Him, neglectful of Him. You know, He, He, think about all the revelation that the Bible gives us that this God who we offend likes us and cares about us and loves us and wants us to be his. And, and so the, the scriptures give us this instruction on patience. Do you need help with patience? I won't, you don't have to raise your hand. And if you don't raise your hand, I know you even need it more than we, the rest of us do anyway. But if you need help with patience, 
read the Bible and here's where it begins, how you get, start to get the help. Look how patient God is with us. And through that, we learn, okay, this is what patience looks like. And what about comfort? Do you need comfort? Again, look at the scriptures and see how good God is to comfort us. And he comforts us and he comforts us in everything. And, and he's comfort, it's comforting to learn of him. And, and so when we look at the Bible, we, we find the patience and comfort of God. And it's supposed to give us hope. And it will if you read it and you discover those things and you go, wow, he really is patient with me. He really has comfort for me. Verse 5 says, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So having me mentioned the comfort and patience of the scriptures, now he reminds us that it's not just the scriptures, it, it's because they come from God, that the comfort and, and patience of the scriptures are, are the comfort and patience of God. Now go, go again and think about, you, it's easy to think about it with others, but think about it with yourself as well, and think about how, patience, how patient God is with you. Think about what we learned in, in uh, chapter 8 where it talks about that God predestined believers to be conformed or made into the image of his son. And at any given moment, if we're even half honest, we know I still got a long way to go. Even after all this time, I got a long way to go. And yet he's still at it, which means he's extremely patient. He is not in a hurry. He is not trying to do a rush job. He's trying to do a thorough, deep, complete job. He's taking his time in working in us because he's going to get all of it done. He's going to do everything that's needed, not just the couple of things that I'm aware of where I fall short or you fall short, but all of it. And, and he's patient in making us into the image of Jesus. He's, he's patient in working us through those areas where we're just wrong. And he's going to get it right. And, and then also how comforting he is in all the different ways. He's comforting toward us when we're afflicted. He's comforting towards us when we're acting lame. And uh, 2 Corinthians 1 tells us he's the God of all comfort. And so verse in fi verses 5 and 6 is also one of Paul's many prayers in the Bible. In fact, in, in this chapter, I think he prays at least twice. He says it as a prayer. And he asks that God would grant us like-mindedness according to Christ Jesus. Now, when it says that, it's important to remember the context here because uh, the context is of chapter 14 and 15 is how different we all are. He, we're all very different. And so he's not saying that he's praying that we're all going to act and think exactly alike. If he said that, that would be a contradiction of everything he said up to this point in chapter 14. It's that He's saying that we ought to have the same mind as it refers to or in light of who Jesus is. On that subject, we got to be on the same page. And, and when it comes to the things of who Jesus is and what Jesus did, that he is God, he became a man in the flesh, he was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life, he died on a cross for our sins, he rose again, he's coming again. He's going to come physically. He's going to take us to be with him. Those are the things that we have to be like-minded on. We can't, we can't be on different pages as it relates to that kind of stuff. We can't be like, oh, that's what you think, but we think this. That's the stuff. There's no, there's no uh, give and take there. We need to be like-minded with each other as it relates to that. And, and he says that as a result of this, when we do that, our worship together is going to be better. If, if we're on the same page about Jesus... We can still have all those other areas where we're totally different. And, and yet we will still have something great because we'll have the most important thing in our lives the same. We'll have the same worship and it'll make worship greater. And that will make any differences pale compared to the unity 
that we have. And that's really what he means. Again, I've said this lots of times, that even in this little church, we're, we're a bunch of different people. Very different people. Not only just in how we are today, but even how we got here. Like, what kind of sinner were you? We were all sinners, but your sin didn't look like my sin. Maybe some of it did, but we were just so different. And, and, but because of Jesus, we're totally united. It, one way it's put is, it, it's been said that the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. It's level. Nobody's like worse off. We're all, we're all standing at the cross looking up going, that's what it took to save me. Whether you grew up in the church or you were complete pagan or anything in between, we're all, we're all in the same place. And, and, but we, can, we get saved and we worship him together. And, and that's the point of showing grace as it relates to these debatable issues. Not to divide over them, but to just see each other and go, yep, sinner just like me. Sinner just like me. Sinner just like me. And, and, and to be able to worship together. Here's why this is so important. Here's why this all ties together with those debatable things. Because when Christians get caught up on the minor things, when we focus on the minor things, or worse, we focus on things that aren't even spiritual at all and somehow try to make them some sort of spiritual thing, what we do is this. We'll start looking at each other and going, well, I, I can't really hang out with them. We have so little in common. I, I, they like sports. I don't like sports. They like to read. I hate reading. I don't know the last time. I, read, I haven't read a book since before high school, you know. I, I, they like to go camping and hunting. I like manicures and pedicures, you know, whatever. And, and, and so, and we can do this. We can look at the people in the church and go, yeah, we go to the same church and all that, and they're a Christian, I'm a Christian, but that's about all we have in common. As if that's some small thing, and those other things are some big thing. How backwards that is. How twisted and wrong that is. And then to go and look at it and go, so, you know, it's hard for me to get along with them because of that. And what a shallow understanding of what it is to be a Christian and what it is to be the church. And it really, more than anything else, it doesn't reveal something about them that they're different than me. It reveals something about me that my understanding is totally wrong on all this. And, and so uh, when we're like-minded regarding Jesus Christ... The most important thing in our lives is connected, our worship. And that's how we ought to be. When we gather together in the name of Jesus, yes, we're a bunch of very, very different people, a bunch of oddballs, and oddballs in odd ways that are different than the oddballs next to us. And, and, but we're united in the greatest thing possible. And so we're to have the same heart for others just like Jesus had. Uh, united by putting each other first, building them up is so much more important than what am I free to do? I can do this. I don't care if they don't like what I do. It's way more than that. And so Jesus shows us, hey, if you need to, pray that you'll be like that and think that way. Verse 7, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth, truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's He's when he says, therefore, receive one another, he's starting to wrap up all of chapter 14 and 15 and this whole idea that, man, we're, we're so different. But his conclusion and everything he said is just simple. Just receive each other. 
and, and, and the same way that Jesus received you. Now, how does Jesus receive us? How did he receive us? Did we have to get perfect first? Did we have to understand and completely agree with everything that he said first? Did we have to line up first and follow all the rules? Did we have to agree on everything? No, not none of that. He just received us by grace. Really, the only thing that we had to agree with is I'm a sinner and I need him to be my savior. And really just that minimal amount of agreement and that I'm going to believe in him for that. That's it. You get in and he receives you that way. And, and, and then Paul speaks about how the Lord did that even with the, and he did that even knowing that the people that were coming in were completely different. And he, and he talks about in those verses we just read how like the, the, the bulk of the people and, or really all the people then and now were totally different in just one huge way alone. And that's some of them were Jews and some of them were Gentiles. And that distinction alone is huge. You know, we sp I spoke a minute ago about some of the differences we have. Like some people like to go hunting and other people like to get their nails done. And that's huge. That's a pretty big watt divide, right? That's a pretty, pretty, pretty big divide. But the difference between Jews and Gentiles is huge. And, and, and he says, but Jesus received those people that differently. And not only that, but when he mentions that, that's also the, the source of all their differences that he's talking about in chapter 14. That's why they're so different, because some of them are Jews and some of them are, are Gentiles. So they have these extremely different backgrounds. But Jesus welcomed them and he had a, and the way he received them and his purpose in drawing both Jews and Gentiles in is, is talked about there in those verses that we just read. It says to the Jews, the, the, he calls them the circumcision. He was a servant for the truth of God. When Jesus came to the Jews, what did he do? He showed them that all those promises God made about a Messiah and about a Savior and about his blessing and, and his promise to bless through Abraham, he's, he's the fulfillment of all that. And the, if the Jew wanted to look at that, they could see that clearly. They could go, that's true. Look at him. He, he fulfills all of that, all those promises. And then to the Gentiles, and he says more about the Gentiles because the Gentiles have no background. They're just a bunch of lost pagans. He, he, it, he tells us that, God, that Jesus made it possible for these godless people to no, no you know, scriptures or anything else that the Jews had, but just these godless people have the ability to know and glorify God. And he quotes a few different passages saying, this isn't something that God just came up with at the last minute. This has been his plan all along. He's been, he's been planning all along. I'm going to save those Gentiles too. And he quotes these passages to let us know that's been in the mind of God. It's been in the plan of God. And again, since this has been God's deal, he welcomes anyone. Jew? Yeah, I'll take the Jews. Gentile? Yeah, I'll take the Really? Gentiles? Gentiles? Really? Yes. He says, okay, that, since that's God's deal, that needs to be our deal too. It are, it we to work together and worship together, regardless of opinions and differences on those little things that are relatively different or relatively little. And then he proclaims something, a praise about God. In verse five, uh, he called God the God of patience and comfort, which is a cool thing because God is the God of patience and comfort. But now he, he calls him also the God of hope. It's always good to remember what kind of God he is. He's a God of patience. He's a God of comfort. He's a God of hope. And, and, and he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you can abound or overflow or have lots of hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul had such a way of saying things. And this is another prayer. It, it, the, I like how the New Living says, verse 13, it says, I, and this is how it makes it, it clarifies that it's a prayer. He says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So that's, he's, that's what he's, pr he's praying. And I, I like to mention this every once in a while when we go through one of the prayers in the, in, the, in the Bible. I love the prayers of the Bible. In 1 John 5, he says, John writes, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and we know if he hears us, we know that we have what we ask for. We know that. If we know that he hears us, we know that we'll get what we're asking for. Well, how do you know that you're praying according to his will? How do you know if, you're, if he's hearing you? Well, one sure way to know, and this isn't the only way, but this is an easy way, is if you find that prayer in the Bible, that means God liked that prayer enough to record. In fact, it was in, that prayer was inspired by the Holy Spirit himself. And so you can take that prayer and you can make that prayer your prayer and you can have a great confidence. I don't know about all the other things I pray. Hopefully I'm praying according to the word of God, according to his will. But if it's found in the Bible, that's a good prayer to pray. And so you can take this prayer and say, I want, that's my prayer. I want, I want to be filled with peace and joy and hope and, and, and believing and we can pray that and not only pray it, but know that that's what he wants for us. Think about that. That's what he's, it's in the Bible. So that means hope. You can pray for hope. God, give me hope. And no, absolutely, I want to give you hope. That's what he would say. God's not going, well, I don't know if hope's for you or not. He wants you to have hope. Joy. Man, I, I'm, I'm miserable a lot. God, would you, can you give me some joy? You don't have to wonder whether he wants to do that or not. He wants you to have joy. Peace. God, I stress out about so much. I, I need peace. Will you give me peace? He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have these things. And so if you want hope and joy and peace and power in the Holy Spirit, then believe this and pray it and, and, and then believe, expect. Verse 14. Now, I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So here, the Apostle Paul acknowledges that he, he's, point, he's saying to them that he's acknowledging, I know you guys are believers. And because of that, that means you're able to grow in the Lord. And, and, and I'm confident concerning you, he says, what you're capable of, that you are filled. As a believer, you're filled. And, and you're able to admonish one another. As a believer, it doesn't have to come from the pastor or the, or the apostle Paul. Believers can admonish one another, encourage one another, urge one another. In other words, I'm not speaking to people who have never been taught. He's telling the Roman Christians, I'm not talking to people who don't know anything about God. You can do this. You are believers. You're Christians. I, and, and God says that with complete confidence. And it's interesting because obviously God always has more confidence than us. But this is an area where he wants us to have more confidence. He wants us to be confident about what we're capable of as Christians, not, not as people all on our own and sinners, but because we're Christians and because the Holy Spirit lives in us, that, that, that as Christians, we need to know. We can grow in the Lord. We can receive from God ourselves. We're also able to bless other people and, and, and admonish other people. And, and he says, we need to know that. Now, what's so amazing about that is Paul had never met these people. He never met them. He didn't, he didn't never talk to them on the phone, no, you know, no FaceTime, just word of mouth. That's what he heard. 
that they're believers. Uh, but up to this point, he'd never met him. He'd never been to Rome. And, but this is what he knew. This is what he knew. And this is how confident he is about what it means to be a Christian. He said, if you guys are really saved, and from what he heard, he didn't have any reason to think they weren't. He said that you can grow and you can minister to each other and you could receive from God. In, in some sense, even though he wants to go minister to them, what he's saying is, you don't need me. You don't need me. Not that he didn't have anything to offer, and he does. He's going to say, he's going to talk about that, and he's already talked about it a lot. But a, trish, a, a, a true Christian is someone who, who can hear the Bible and believe it and receive what it says and have it transform their life. And, and, and he knew that, and we should know that too. We don't have to worry. Really, when, when, when we teach the Word of God or when we encourage you to read it and you read it and pray over it and, and listen to it and believe it, we can know. We don't have to worry, man, is this doing anything? Like, I don't have to look out at you and go, is this, are they even, is this doing anything? It's doing something. It is absolutely doing something. And when you read it, when you have your quiet time, when you're listening to it, you know, here or it's doing something. You can, you can, you can bet on it. It's, you're going to get something out of it. And, and, uh, and you can use it. And Paul was also sure that he's also telling them here that he's absolutely confident and sure that he is called by God to minister to Gentiles. And the Roman church, church was mostly Gentiles. Not every church was like that at the time. There was churches where there was a lot of Jews, but for the most part, the church was more and more becoming a Gentile church, and the church in Rome certainly was. And the Apostle Paul's letting him know, man, I have a heart to reach out to you guys. Why? Because that's what God called him to do. God gave him this gifting. Now, what that means is this. If the Apostle Paul was given this ministry and this gifting to minister to Gentiles, that teaches us that when God gives you a gifting, and when God gives you a, a heart for a certain ministry or a certain group of people or a certain something, uh, you need to know that you're not necessarily going to, no, not everyone else is going to have that exact same calling and heart and burden that you have. God wants to give everybody a burden, everybody a ministry, everybody a heart. But he gives different giftings and focuses to different people for a reason. But, but the thing is, is if he gave you some burden for someone or some type of ministry, then you need to use it because not everybody else has that. What it means is he gave it to you so, because he wants you to do it. For example, not everybody has a heart to teach little kids. It doesn't mean you shouldn't ever attempt to pour into a little kid. You, if you have the opportunity, do it, whether you have a heart to or not. But not everybody is like, man, I just love teaching kids. I want to teach the kids. If you have that, you need to do it because that's from God. Or, or not everybody has a heart to go talk to strangers about Jesus on the street. That doesn't mean you never should. It doesn't mean that, if the, that the Holy Spirit will never urge you to go talk to somebody you don't know about the Lord. But not everybody has a burden and a heart and an urge to go and do that. And so if you do, do it. Don't, don't hold that back. Not everyone has a heart to go on a missions trip. There's people that have a heart. They, I want to go to another country and just minister to these people in this place. Not everybody has that. If you have it, use it when you can. Not everybody has a heart to lead. You get it. The Apostle Paul was given this heart to go and like go out there and do this. And he's like, and so I want to. And, and the same can be a set of us. Paul knew, what, Paul knew that God made him. And, and God, Paul knew what God, what God made him as an apostle to the Gentiles. And he let the Roman believers know, that's why I'm reaching out to you the way that I am. 
because it's just in me. God put this in me. And, and it's not because he thought, oh, those Roman Christians, they're not going to do any good as believers until I get there and straighten them out. It wasn't like that. He said, I know you guys are capable. But, man, God's given me this burden to ministry, and that's what I want to do. Verse 17, therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in these things which pertain to God. For I will dare not, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Here, here the Apostle Paul is explaining how he glories in the Lord for the ministry that, ministry that he has. He's not, he's not telling him about his ministry right now to brag. Yeah, I'm the Apostle Paul, you guys. You know, he, that's not what he's doing. He, he makes, when he says, uh, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me. Sometimes people take that to mean it, to, and wrongly take that to mean that you can't teach on anything if you haven't like mastered it yourself. If that were the case, there would be no pastors. There would be nobody teaching. I'm here to tell you I pre try to preach to myself first because most of what I read convicts me before it convicts you. And that's how it should be. So it doesn't mean, you know, I can't teach anything until I've got it all down. What he's saying here is, I, I don't speak about things which Jesus hasn't impressed upon me and convicted of me and put in me first. I'm, when I'm telling you what I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul says, these aren't made up stories in order to puff myself up. I'm, try, I'm not trying to make myself look better. I, I just want to tell you what he's done through me. And, and the purpose is, is so that my ministry will be more effective. And part of what he needed from that wasn't just so that they would know, but so that he would be reminded. Here he is, he's going all over the place to all these people, and he needs to often be reminded, God's using you. He needs to tell, it's almost like self-talk for himself. God uses you. Don't be afraid. God uses you. Remember what he did in that town? God work, will work through it in this town, too. And, and we need that. You know, we need to remember, hey, God's worked through you before. You don't have to be like, God's never going to do anything. He's worked through you before. Don't ever forget what he's done through you before. And then, and then go from there. And, and, and so he says, God has done many amazing things through me. Yeah, he's done mighty signs and wonders, not by my power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the result is, I've been able to preach all over the place. Jerusalem to Illyricum, all these other places. And, he, and he's, he's saying, I've been used in many places in powerful ways. Again, not to brag, but because of that, through this, he had all kinds of confidence. You gain confidence when you, in the Lord, when you go in the name of the Lord and do the things of the Lord and then watch what he does through it. Because if you do nothing, you'll never see him do anything through it. That's how that works. Somebody said it this way. You know, God, yeah, God leads us and, and guides us, but is, no illustration's perfect, but I like it. He, he says, God can't steer a parked car. You can't steer a parked car, right? You can turn the wheel, but it's not, you have to be moving. And the Apostles Paul says, I've been moving, and every time I move, I see God working through me, and what that's done in res as a result is I have more confidence you, we will have no confidence in the Lord if we're, if we're not going and doing something. And it's a hard trap if you get sucked into that trap. I'm not trying anything. Why not? Because I just don't think God's going to use me. Well, how do you know if he's going to use you if you're not going? And, and so that, that's how he works in us. Paul, Apostle Paul saying, I'm just telling you, that's how it's worked for me. He's, he's working through me. And, and everywhere I go, he works through me. Jerusalem, Illyricum, he's naming all these different places in the, in the Roman Empire. And then when that happens, what the result is, you become more amazed. You're like, wow, he really does use me. He really does use me. I don't have to be afraid. I don't know how it works. You know, Jesus fed thousands through the small amount of food more than once. I don't know this, but I would imagine 
The second time around, they were probably a little less freaked out that this was going to happen because they'd already seen it happen at least once. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong on that, but, but if, we, if we do nothing, we see nothing. If we see nothing, we won't have boldness. If we do something, we'll see something. If we see something, we'll have more boldness. That's what Paul saw, verse 20. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So here the Apostle Paul has is telling him why he's been speaking of what God has been done through him and why he's, he's writing. He says, I've been all over the place. And since I've been all over the place, I always want to preach to people who have never heard. Why? Because that's his gifting. That's what he is as an apostle. You know, he's a trailblazer. He's going, he's going places where it, the gospel's never been heard. And he says, and I don't want to build on another man's foundation. If somebody else has already been doing a work, I don't want to do that. You know what? We need more of that today. Here's why. We live in a time of church hopping. We live in a time where people are just like, the, and it's hard. I'm not saying there's an easy solution to this. But like, you know, most churches nowadays are happy to get anybody. We're happy to get anybody. The Apostle Paul was like, well, if, hey, if you've already heard, I'm going to go somewhere where they haven't heard. I want to see people get saved. And, we, and, I, and that's, we want that. We want to see people get saved. Fine, if somebody's not going to a church and they need a good church, we're not, we, okay, we want you to grow. We feel like we're doing the right thing here, teaching the Word of God. We feel like that's good. And if you're not getting that where you're at, then come, come on down, be blessed here. But we also want to see people get saved. And that's what the Apostle Paul's saying. He's saying, I, I want to go see people get saved. I want to go to places like that. And, and he tells them, that's why, that's one of the reasons why, he's just being honest. He said earlier on in chapter 1, I've been trying to get to you, I haven't been able to get to you. Now he tells them why. I've been really busy trying to go out and get people saved. I know you guys are saved, I, so it's not as urgent. I've been spending a lot of time, you know, doing, going to the unreached places. And, and he tells them, that's why I haven't visited. But then he says... I've been, I feel like I've been everywhere I can go where people haven't been saved. And that's an awesome commentary because he's saying, man, the gospel has really spread a lot at this point. So he's been all, I've, I've been going to places where people haven't been saved. I don't know where else to go that's like that. I'm going to go to Spain. I don't know if anybody's been to Spain yet. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to, he's telling him his plans. I'm going to go to Spain. And when I go to Spain, that's when I'll stop off and see you guys. That's when I'm going to come. I love that. He's got a plan. And, and all of that, but then he says, but first I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And, and he, he is going to end up in Rome, but after Jerusalem. It's not going to be freely like he wants to on his way to Spain either. He's going to get sent there. Uh, you can read all that in the last chapters of the book of Acts. And, and here's what's awesome about all this. Paul's saying, I don't know where else to go where there hasn't been anybody reached yet. He's not saying everybody's been reached. He's saying there's a church established there. There's believers there. They can do ministry there now. And I've been, I mean, it's, I've been all over the place where this is the case now. And, and so, but here's what he, here's what's awesome. He doesn't, that doesn't mean he feels like there's nothing else for him to do. That doesn't mean he feels like that he can just retire now. That, you know, mission accomplished, job complete. He, he, he says, okay, well, if there's nowhere else that I can think of to go where they haven't been reached, then I will start going to the places that they have been reached. And I'll encourage them, and I'll build them up. And that's what he's writing about as it relates to the Romans. I love that. What an attitude. I love that Pastor Chuck, if you don't know Pastor Chuck, who Pastor Chuck was, the founder of Calvary Chapel, he preached, I'm pretty sure he preached 
I think he died on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday. And I'm pretty sure he preached either the Wednesday before or the Sunday before. I'm like 99% sure of that. He just kept going. And, and just kept going to, to encourage and just, this is my job until he calls me home. And, and for us, we're to, we're to be about his business. That's really the deal. We'll have plenty of time to retire in heaven. That's the deal, you know, just reaching out. It's not about how much fun can we have while we're here. It's it, actually living the Christian life can be fun. A lot of times it is, a lot of times it's difficult. You can go both ways. But it's not just to have, you know, big, huge, fun, interesting events. It's definitely not to store up treasures here. It's to store up treasures there. And, and it's not about leisure and comfort and rest. It's nice when you can get a break from time to time. I just came back from one. It was great. But, man, we get to serve him. We get to live for him. And the Apostle Paul's ultimate attitude as it relates to this when he was writing in 2 Timothy was he's like, man, I'm, I'm torn. I, I can't wait to go home to be with the Lord, but I also know that it's better if I stick around and am able to minister to you guys for longer. And so we reach out, we build each other up, and we want this attitude. Verse 26, For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Now, he just got done saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem first. Now he's telling why he's going to go to Jerusalem first. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I, then I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. So here he's wrapping up. He's just giving them all the details of his plan and why he doesn't just come now. And, and what it was was this. There was a famine going on in the area of Jerusalem, and the, the Christians in Jerusalem were being persecuted a lot. And so they were going through really hard times. Financially, a lot of the believers in Jerusalem were very poor. And, and some of the believers in Macedonia, Christians, who were a lot, of, a lot of Gentiles there, had heard about the struggles of the Christians in Jerusalem. And, and so they wanted to bless them. So they made a collection. They're like, it'd be like now, all the, you know, the, how uh, there was the hurricane in the Bahamas, and they got wiped out, and people, a lot of Christians are going, let's, we need to get there. We need to send something. We need to send a team. We need to help. That's how Christians do it. That's what we do. And, and they, we don't know them, but they're our brothers. We, we love them, and if there's any way we can help, we want to help. And so they were doing that. And so Paul had collected this gift Offering. It's not the only time we read about this in the New Testament either. We read about something like this in Philippians. And he says, I need to go there first and deliver this. So they're the priority right now, Jerusalem. And then when I'm done there, I'll go to Spain. On my way to Spain, I'll stop off and I'll see you guys. And, and Paul said, and here, here's, here's why those believers in Macedonia wanted to do that. Here's why. He said, if the Gentiles have been partakers of, of their spiritual things, they feel like it's their duty, their obligation, they owe it to minister to them in material things. Well, how did they do that? How did they benefit from them spiritually? The, the scriptures are Jewish scriptures. The, the Messiah is a Jewish Messiah. Every, we owe everything that we've been blessed tremendously as Gentiles through the Jewish believers. And we, we talked about that in uh, chapter 9, we talked about that in chapter 1. And the believers in Macedonia fully recognize that. And they're like, man, we owe everything to those Jewish people. And, what? and, he, and he's saying that in light of the fact that he knows that those, it's not like he's, that they think that the Jewish Christians were like better. They didn't, that's not what they, he was saying, that's not what they thought. But just that through those people, they were so blessed that like this is their opportunity. This is their chance to somehow give something back. And they're like, we have to do that. We want to do that. We're going to do that. And Paul's like, yeah, amen. I'll deliver it for you. And, and so 
their attitude was, of course we want to be givers. Of course we want to. We've been so blessed spiritually. We can't return the favor that way. All that spiritual blessing came through them. That, that's how God wanted it. But we can bless them materially when they need it. And so let's do that. And, and Paul talked about that in Galatians 2. He said, let him who's taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And so this, pr this principle of giving. And that's the way that giving works. Those who know that they have received are happy to give. And those who don't, sometimes they'll still give, but it's not cheerfully. Or sometimes they won't give at all because they don't, really, they don't realize how much they've received. What a blessing it is to know how much you've received and then to say, Psh, I want to give. No pressure. I, I actually want to do this. It's beautiful. And, and, and then he said that he would come fully confident when he comes. I know I'll be a blessing when I get there. Verse 30, now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. That I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. Paul knows that when he goes to uh, Jerusalem, it's going to be rough. And, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. That I, that I may come to you and with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So the last thing he says in the chapter is he lets them know how he's been praying and goes, will you pray with me? I've been praying, he's, he's saying, that, you know, God will help me out. I know it's going to be rough when I get to Jerusalem. Will you pray with me about that? And, and, and that when I serve those saints there, I've been praying that, that they'll be blessed by it. Will you pray that they'll be blessed by it too? And, and that when I come to you, I've been praying that it, it'll be a great time. It'll be a blessing. It'll be joy. And that we'll be refreshed together. Will you pray that too? Pray for me. I love this because he, having spoken with such great confidence about God's hand upon him, he still knows I need help. This isn't all automatic. This isn't all like a done given deal. I need God's blessing and I'm praying for it, but I want you to pray for it too. And, and so he's asking them to pray. Sometimes when you're in ministry, you're so able to like, whether you're doing it with the right heart or not, it's easy to just be focused on what are these, what, are, what, do, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? What's needed? What job needs to be done? What, what needs to, you know, what, what needs taking care of? And it's so easy to get caught up in that and to be giving, giving, giving. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that. We're, I'm not, I'm not even about to go like, Oh, what about some me time? That's not what I mean. But to not forget that there are, all, there's a whole church around us. Let me say it this way. This is my church too. This is your church. This is my church too. You guys need prayer. I need prayer. The apostle Paul needed prayer. He prayed for them. He said, pray for me too. And, and I don't just, not just me. There's other people that serve a lot around here. You're doing stuff all the time. Don't forget to pray for them. And, and then on top of that, the example that he gives where he's not afraid to ask for it. He's not afraid to ask for it. He's not like going, well, I just hope somebody's praying for me out there. He's like, hey man, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray that the ministry's going good. Pray that it's effective. Pray for me. And, and, and so, you know, pray for me. <laughs> I'm glad he gives this example. Pray for me. Pray that the things that we want to do around here, pray for me specifically. And I, know, I love when I go like to the men's group or we pray on Sunday mornings or we pray on Monday nights. I love when I, I love it. I, it's just, I love it when I hear some of the guys and I don't, I don't always ask, but I hear uh, some of the guys will just pray for me and they'll pray and I, and not just for me. And I love when I hear people praying for my family. You probably love it too. Don't you love it when someone prays for you? Never be afraid to ask for prayer. I don't want to make anybody feel 
bad, but we have a prayer box and prayer cards. We, we will pray when you put those in. And I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to why it gets used so often. I don't know. Maybe you're getting prayer somewhere else. That's fine. That's okay. We're cool with that. But if you're not, then ask for prayer. If the Apostle Paul asked for prayer, remember when Jesus went in the garden? He said, hey, watch with me. I'm going to pray. I want you in on this, is what he was saying. And so all these plans that he has, he's like, but I still need your prayers. What, a, what an awesome thing it is to be in the body of Christ. What, a, what, a, what an awesome thing it is to have all us different, totally different people united in something so great as being children of God. And then we're on the same page, we're working on the same things, we, we have the same goals. We wanna see people get saved, we wanna see Christians grow in the Lord. We wanna see outreach be effective. We wanna see ministry you know, happening and being built up. We wanna see people getting prayed for and loved on. And so we pray that that's what would be going on here. And if you're not a Christian yet, listen, it's simple. Make, repent of your sins. That means just turn your heart and your attitude around from it's okay to sin to I don't want to live this way anymore. Turn to God in faith. Make a commitment that you're going to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior from now on. Believe that he died on the cross and he rose again because that's what you needed and then depend on him alone, that, that he'll save you. He'll go, if you do that, you'll be born again. The Holy Spirit will come into your life and never leave. And he will be with you every day to urge you to continue believing in Jesus and walk with him. And then when you die, you go to heaven forever. So if you're not a Christian yet, even if you're not here in this room, you're listening on the radio or online, Receive Jesus by faith and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness and your love and your grace. And Lord, we thank you for the plans that you have in our lives and for our church. And so Lord, we pray your blessing upon us, each one. We pray that anyone here that needs to know you would come to you by faith right now and believe in you and be saved. Lord, bless our fellowship now, and as we, after we sing the last song, we're going to go have some food. Bless that food to our bodies and bless the fellowship that we have around it. And we love you, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for one last song. Let's sing Holy Spirit. in
more time. Holy Spirit. got tacos in the back. God bless you guys. <laughs>